Michael Tomaski wrote this, or Tomaski, I'm, I'm not sure how he pronounces it. I think it's Tomaski. Uh, for the uh, Daily Beast. And it's titled, Why Obama's Haters Are Worse Than Bush's Haters. And he, he gets, you know, uh, he gets into how, uh, and, and without quoting his, uh, his piece at length, you know, let me just summarize it in my own words. Because I, I, it, was, it, it was brilliant, and, and it was uh, consistent with some things that I've said on this program in the past, and yet it was so concise, it really crystallized it for me, and I wanted to share this with you and give credit to Michael for this. What he's suggesting in this article, or what what I got out of it, let me let me share this as as this was the insight that I got. I, I he may his article may be more nuanced or less, and it may be you know the point of it may be something somewhat different than what I'm characterizing. So, but essentially was that when conservatives talk about liberals or even Democrats like Obama, who is certainly no liberal. I mean, maybe he is deep down in his heart, but as President of the United States, he has behaved very much as a centrist, as a modern-day centrist Democrat, which 60 years ago would have been a centrist Republican. And I don't mean that as a criticism. It's just this is how it is. You know, nobody can accuse Obama of being like a socialist. I mean, there's not even a public option in Obamacare, for example. And he's, he's talked about being willing to... Uh, you know, put the chain CPI on, on Social Security rather than expanding the program. Social Security, one of the few programs that you could actually argue is socialist. So, when conservatives characterize Democrats, they do it in the, in the context of culture. Our way of life is under siege. That person thinks differently than we do, lives differently than we do, has a different set of values than we do, is the other. Now, this is characteristic, and, and Tomaski doesn't get into this at all in his article, but I'm, I'm going to add this. This is characteristic of movements, conservative movements, worldwide and throughout history. The uber-conservative movement of the fascists, for example, in Italy. Or Spain, the I'm not I'm not going to even go to Germany because because of the old saying about you lose the argument. But we can do this with others. The Pinochet, you know, taking over in Chile. Who is he killing? I mean, he was literally executing people, throwing people out of hel helicopters. Killed so many people in the national stadium. There are a lot of people who won't go to the soccer games in the national stadium because they think it's desecrating the memories of the the mass murders that Pinochet held there. Pinochet, of course. You know, did this military coup. By the way, Michel, Michel Bachelet, in Chile they pronounce the T. Uh, Michel Bachelet was uh, just elected along with a large enough uh, majority in the, in, the, in the legislature in Chile that it looks like she's actually going to be able to get some good progressive left-wing stuff going in Chile. It's a big deal because the previous president was a conservative, and then the previous president before that was her. And she couldn't get anything done because the parliament stalled her. So the people in Chile have said, okay, cool, bring it back. But I digress. Um, when you look at, cons at the rationale that conservatives have, have historically used, whether it was Mussolini or Franco or, or Pinochet, or the conservatives who were blowing up churches and, and killing black kids in the South. The conservatives that made up the Ku Klux Klan. The conservatives that made up what used to be the Democratic Party back in the 30s, all the way back to the mid-1800s, all throughout the 19th century, who, who promoted apartheid in the United States. Segregation now, segregation forever, right? It was a conservative position. I was a Democrat saying that, but he was a conservative Democrat, George Wallace and Lester Maddox. And those are the positions, you know, this was Nixon's whole Southern strategy was, you know, LBJ threw those guys off the Democratic Party bus 
by signing the Civil Rights Act, and so let's pick them up for the Republican Party, and they did. But anyhow, conservatives always frame the other side as being different culturally. Liberals, on the other hand, when they talk about the opposition, they don't talk about culture. They talk about politics. And this is his point about Obama's haters are worse than Bush's haters. Because when we, back during the Bush administration, we who disliked Bush, the Bush administration policies were criticizing Bush, we were not saying things like George Bush is, well, not all of us. <laughs> I guess in some ways I was saying you know, but but by and large, the the the, the Bush was like the, you know the next right winger. You know, he's taking us in a fascistic direction. But by and large, the Democratic critique of Bush was mostly we don't like his policies, we don't like the war, we don't like his tax cuts for rich people. You know, very specific things. We don't like these policies. Whereas the conservative critique of Obama tends to be, the guy's a socialist. He's not really an American. Where's his birth certificate? Those kinds of things. And so the, you know, I, I just thought that was really interesting, that liberals, by and large, are not wired to view conservatives as something other than being fully human brothers and sisters. In fact, it's, it's wired into the liberal DNA. I mean, the closest I could get to this in my, in my criticisms of Bush, at my most extreme, was to say that he's probably a sociopath. In other words, he's one of us, but he's like defective, damaged goods. Whereas the conservative critique of liberals is they're not even one of us. I thought this was really, really interesting. Okay, number one. Uh, number two, the uh, this whole issue of... Uh, Companies, this is a, a great piece in the Washington Post, companies agreeing to buy back their shares or, or aggressively buying back their shares. What this is doing, companies buying back their shares, is it is driving inflation of the stock market. The stock market bubble is being driven in part by companies buying back their own shares. It also jacks up CEO salaries and takes money out of the economy. So, you know, Cisco just announced that they're buying back a huge, uh, well, two and a half, they're, they're spending $15 billion. That's They only made $10 billion. They're spending $15 billion to buy back their shares. That's two and a half times what they spent on, spent on R&D. And they just laid off 4,000 people. So not expanding their company. They're just making their stockholders richer, which includes their CEO and their senior executives. This is the Tom Hartman Program. Which is an argument to roll back the old Reagan policies, the policies that changed during the Reagan administration of allowing CEOs to be paid with stock. 